Hi and welcome to Epicenter. This is episode 382. My name is Brian Crane and I'm here with Sunny Agarwal. Today we're speaking with Alex Salnikov from the NFT marketplace and protocol Rarible. Let's get to the episode. So we're here today with Alex Salnikov and we're going to speak about Rarible and we're going to speak about NFTs. You know, in the preparation for this episode, I was was really kind of diving in, trying out Rarible. I bought a few NFTs and it was just like a really cool experience and really enjoyed it. Also, the listening to Alex on another interview. So I'm really excited to to have this conversation about, you know, NFT and also Rarible and where this space is take, going. So thanks so much for joining us, Alex. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me today. So maybe you can start at the beginning. So how did you get interested in, in the crypto space and what has your journey been since you got involved? Oh, that's, that's a really nice question. So my, my journey into the crypto space uh, began in 2012. Uh, that, that was quite early. I think we didn't have anything except for Bitcoin back then. And uh, I am a technical person. I studied computer science and later data science in one of the best economics universities here in the country. So um, my, my, my background is purely technical. And when, when I understood how it all works on the background, the, this powerful idea of blockchain and ultimate ownership that I as an IT person would be able to digitally sign uh, a transaction and without it, it would never move that I, I was just hooked on that idea. Uh, I know it promised to change the world. It promised to change the financial system, how we have it today. The monetary system of Bitcoin was amazing. I was just dragged all over my head to, to, the, to the space. And since then, I actually haven't been building anything else. I'm, I'm a completely crypto native person that started his career in the blockchain space and still in the blockchain space. Were you working on anything before you started Rarible? Yes, yes, of course. We've done numerous stuff. So the first project was was Trading Robot. Uh, we've assembled the Trading Robot. The market was completely inefficient. It still is not efficient as as, as we uh, wanted it to be. But but back then, the simple like EMA strategy would, would give you the massive returns. And we assembled the Trading Robot that that, that was trading uh, crypto, and it felt amazing. Uh, then we moved to build a fiat on ramp and off ramp to the crypto to Bitcoin again from from local bank and card providers uh, we even had the bank that that wanted to allow us to process credit cards what what is only available now on the market they they didn't like fully understand what what they were doing <laughs> with this, this thing but they were curious to try and i know at some point central bank advised uh the banks not not to deal with cryptocurrency and uh, um, that that was it for 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 on ramp and we decided to to build an exchange a centralized exchange uh, with short sales leverages futures again uh, a little bit ahead of the market and 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 below our own capabilities I would say uh, we've built a, a nice exchange with a, that supported one million trades per second on the matching engine that was built in memory a really beautiful piece of software. We struggled with liquidity. Uh, the large exchanges, the large exchanges were were quite ahead of us in in, in that sense. All over that journey, we assembled such a great team that is still working with us on Rarible. Uh, we we had we have our head of design from Russian big tech company Yandex. I don't know if if our listeners know that one. Uh, we have our CTO who represented the country on the world physics contest. We have that the talented team, and and that that that's the main resource that we assembled on working in this in this space, because it requires team with quite unique um, mindset and and skill set. So yeah, that that's that's our journey uh, in, in the crypto space. That's really fascinating. So how, how big is that team, you know, that has kind of persisted through these years? And can you tell a little bit about like, what has allowed you guys to work together, you know, so well and kind of like grow together over these years? 
what have allowed us to work together. I think that's the shared mission. We, we started working with our designer. We, we asked them to draw us, uh, to create a logotype for us. And we, I, I remember this evening when we sat on the roof of some building and we're discussing blockchain and just onboarded him to, to this world, shared this idea of how that can work eventually with, with all the things uh, built from scratch in, in this new uh, ideology of, of, of a free, free market. And, and he was hooked as well. Sometimes I think that, that blockchain attracted that many great minds because it's literally the financial system building code. So uh, it's something that gives engineers so much uh, power, so, so, much, uh, so much potential to, to rewrite something that's work, that works now imperfectly and that was built by, by people. And, and we are usually quite technocratic, I would say. So yeah, I think, I think blockchain just, just empowered engineers with this ability to rebuild something from scratch in code that was built by people and is not as efficient as we want it to be. So uh, th that's, that's really touching to anybody who has this technical mind. And so what brought you to NFTs? So, you know, like you mentioned that you, you, you're mostly on the technical side. So was it an artist friend or something? Like, how did you learn about this, like, about this even market as a whole? Being that long in the blockchain space, you probably know uh, all the all the great things happening out there. And basically, we we of course we knew about NFTs with CryptoKitties launching and all, and all that. Uh, we definitely knew about the market from the very beginning. Uh, I think the beginning was in 2017. Uh, and we started building wearable in 2019. And uh, I know that, that was this moment when we decided that we need to build something more, more fun, more, more emotional, more, more close to the user than because like all the previous projects were financial and technical and, and we wanted something more fresh, something new. We just went out to the market. We decided to create several NFTs and just try them out. And, and there, wasn't, uh, there wasn't even a place to create NFTs out there uh, or maybe some, some, some small pages that allowed you to do that. Uh, and, we, and we minted a couple NFTs and we flipped them inside the teams. I, saw, I sold one to designer. He minted this, um, this visual skate deck with AR symbol. Uh, and and that, that just felt right. I had this feeling uh, that we can give all the users the same sense of ownership that we all had since the beginning, being, that, being in that uh, cryptocurrency market. We all knew that our money is definitely our money, that, that nobody would be able to move them except for us making these transactions. And this idea is so, is so powerful, it's so rewarding in the sense that you feel safe. And we wanted to give that same sense of ownership to everybody out there, not even the financially um, not even the, to the only financial use cases, but, but more broadly. And NFTs felt just perfect in that regard. They, they are visual, they, they have an image attached, they have a name, they have a description, they are digestible. You, you can understand what is it. It's tangible, it's almost like an item. You can, you can almost touch it and, and feel it, and that it is in your wallet. It's just, just the direct analogy of a digital item that you have in your pocket. It's, it's, it's almost literally, you can feel it in your pocket when, when you have it in your wallet and your mobile. That was so amazing, that explanation. When I heard your, your podcast on, on the Zero Knowledge podcast, that was the thing that I also remembered the most vividly was when you talked about this idea of ownership. And I think you said that you think ownership is an emotion and I had never heard anybody, I think, say it like that and it, it's in, and now it's also interesting how you talk about these nfts as this tangible thing you can own so i'm wondering like why is there is there something different about like nfts and sort of the sense of ownership 
you can have there versus you know bitcoin and cryptocurrencies well the technical idea is the same but but the, the perception of that idea is much more vivid i think well, I said that uh, ownership is an emotion because basically an emotion is something that is wired down inside inside the human. We we tend to own things. We love to possess things, especially scars. Uh, we want uh, I know this this instinct of collectibles. It's wired deep down the human nature, and that's why it's it's so touching. And, and when you add the picture, it crosses to the second like instinct. It has much more like this attachment, psychological attachment to the, to the thing. That's why I onboarded a lot of people to, to blockchain and almost any one of them wanted to have at least one Bitcoin. And it doesn't really matter how many Bitcoins you have 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 or 1.5, but they all wanted to have just one just because it's this psychological again behavioral a completely irrational thought that that you want to to have this uh, thing and you, and you want it to be yours as a whole and and G nft gives you this idea that uh, it, it, it's so digestible this digital item is yours period it's so simple you know, the first time I felt that like ownership as a motion thing, I have a friend who um, lives in Kentucky and he like has like a like 2000 acre ranch or something there. I was asking him like, you know, what's the point of having all this land? Like, you know, you don't even use it for anything. It's mostly just like wooded and everything. He's like, you know, I, I hear you. But like sometimes when I'm just like riding my thing, like my, my golf cart through the uh Man, it's like, you know, that tree, that I, that's my tree, that deer that's living there, that's my deer. And it's like really interesting to see that as we are going to move now to more of like this like virtual digital world, like that sense of ownership of like physical land and the objects on it is going to like translate to like, you know, especially if we look at things like decentral land and things like this, where it's like, you know, digital land and digital objects that are living in these like virtual worlds that we're going to start to inhabit. Exactly. This, this feeling is so ancient. And besides, you never truly own anything right right now on the internet in, in the current model. You know, probably the the most uh, the most reliable reliably owned thing right now on the internet is the main name. You, you you literally like own it with a lot of legal support. All the other things, your Facebook page, uh, your Spotify music library, they they are they all are kind of not yours. You're you're renting them from from these platforms, and uh, they they have too much control over it. And not that it's it's a really bad thing, but I know. Can you move your library from Spotify to Apple Music? So you know you had this vision of NFTs for like you know since you started Rarible, which is like over a year ago now, but then suddenly in the last like three to four months, it seems the whole world has caught on to the vision, and so. What's driving this massive adoption of NFTs and like, especially using the variable platform today? Well, uh, I think a lot of things uh, came to that point and I'd love to go, go back to the variable story a little bit to, to make sure that uh, it's all, uh, it's all in line because you know, when we first started Wearable, we didn't know, we knew that NFTs are great, but we didn't know what, what, which part of them is great. That's why we wanted to give our users ability to experiment on, on what will be the hot thing inside NFTs. And we created this, this platform where there, there is no hint of what you are expected to create. Uh, and people started creating anything, some, some, uh, art objects or tickets, uh, some some charity co collectibles. So th there was a lot of ideas, uh, and and this and this uh, crypto media, uh, crypto art segment with with music and videos and pictures really spiked, uh, just because there is no such place on the internet right now to to sell your digital content for uh, this way, so that the new owner would be able to resell it. So we basically, uh, NFT world basically created uh, this level of ownership for, for the all digital content out there. 
and and this was 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 so rewarding uh, and and the platform was open people started to mint they started to referring their friends we've put a lot of efforts into making it so easy to use and i think that's the same idea that's driving the adoption right now how about now every piece of content would have its owner and not just creator uh, and that ownership to be transferable and soldable. We added, at some point, we added multiple editions. We added royalty support. You, you can set up arbitrary number from zero to 100% of, of the subsequent sales that would be downstream to you as a creator. This whole idea was, was so powerful and, and pandemic definitely accelerated the situation. People started to look over over the new uh, concepts of of how they can how can they engage with the audience, and I think like from from inside it feels kind of it's not that space started to boom last for the last three months. Uh, it, it was growing constantly on the behind, uh, one, like exponentially two x uh, months to months at least and. And that feels slow from the beginning. It's like one, two, five, ten, one hundred. And, and then, <laughs> I don't know, at some point there is an inflection point and everybody's, uh, and, and this process be, comes from the undercover to, to be open and, and people, and people are, are all over it suddenly. I think NBA Top Shot definitely played a, bil- a big role in, in bringing that space forward. Um, the team behind the first uh, NFTs ever, the, the first most popular NFTs ever, CryptoKitties. They created this game uh, with, with credit card support, with this large IP rights holder NBA uh, that um, just unleashed, unleashed this, this mass adoption. So I'm wondering if you could go in a little bit this idea of like, ownership uh, in the nft context because you know you said uh, one thing i'm curious about here like you know because you said oh you can like truly own an nft but then on the wearable platforms there's also this thing about right if you have like resales uh maybe some percentage goes back to the original creator so i'm wondering like how can you actually enforce that and you know if kind of people really control it you know, they can transfer ownership. How do you know what they paid or? It's a great question. So the way it works right now, uh, when, when you create an NFT, this percentage of royalties is backed in the asset. And it looks like just a number inside the asset. And basically any platform can decide whether to respect that royalty stream or not. Obviously you can't enforce royalties pay out on the transfer level if i just transfer this item from one of my wallets to another i i don't originate the sale and i i don't i, I don't pay anything and i i don't i don't stream this royalty stream to anyone so it's not really that enforceable because you can always make this otc trade by just taking somebody else's money and sending them this token directly but in reality, uh, a lot of platforms respect this, this royalty, royalty field and, and working together on respecting in more. Uh, people are boycotting platforms that say we won't, we won't do that. So there is like this self-regulation in the market. Everybody understands that empowering the creators that they created the item in the first place is important for the for the public space for for everybody here in the NFT and the NFT market. Just briefly on that, that's really fascinating, and I guess it almost is then more sort of a statement, right? That's like made by the artist when they create the NFT and that's like intrinsically part of the NFT is like, oh, I would, you know, I sort of demand or ask for on these resales that like, you know, each time I get 10% or 25%, but would it be possible and have you guys considered, you know, like, like you do the link between that and the actual legal right? Yes, that's just the right question, I would say. So I think the closest analogy out there for the NFT market is that you're trading uh, IP rights to, to something. 
you're saying that this digital item belongs to you and digital item is mostly just just an intellectual property over something so uh and when we see how the market works we can almost feel that it recreates this ap market patterns so uh sometimes people sell an nft and they are totally okay with the new owner doing anything with it they are okay now you own this thing you can print it you can burn it you can use the image or audio on the video or the video the, the, uh, however you want uh, and i'll print it on the t-shirt and make some money over it and and they are completely free about it on the other hand, there are artists that are saying, you know, I want you to have non-exclusive right to that item and you're, you're free to use it the way you want, but I will be uh, using it as well. And by the way, I don't want you to make any money out of using that image except for reselling the NFT itself. So you can't use it in, in any uh, website or any commercial enterprise. So it really just a license, a several types of licenses that inherently are built in into that world. It's not yet public and explicit about the licenses, uh, but I, I strongly believe that the market would adopt these licenses and you would, you would see that this NFT gives you specific rights over the content according with this big document saying every part of what you receive and what you, and what you don't receive. And we're working internally on one of those features uh, to make sure that you will be able to do that. But I'm pretty sure that if you just say in the description what are the rights that would be respected by, by legal authorities if, if, if there was, was ever a dispute. Ownership as a motion, I think that's something I've started to get a little bit recently, but I also always just felt that ownership like usually implies like certain capabilities, right? As the owner of it, of something, I can do something that other people cannot. This is why like a lot of the earlier NFT art, I was like, oh, but I don't, I'm not, I don't fully get it, right? Like I don't, I can see the GIF even if I'm not the owner. But then I think what, what, what changed it for me was hash masks. Because hash masks came along and said, hey, as the owner, you can name this artwork. And to me, that was like a big like, oh, wow, okay, this is like ownership implies certain capabilities that non-owners do not have. And it's like, then you get to be part of this living artwork where it's like, you know, it's this character that has this like history of names and stuff. And so what are new types of capabilities that you see coming where art can become more, NFT art can become even more interactive and interact with its owners than traditional art? We pioneered the space with introducing something that's culture. We hide an arbitrary piece of information and only the owner would be able to access that. People instantly found a ton of use cases. They started to sell as an instruction how to obtain the physical item or uh, Mark Cuban did this, this NFT that allowed the owner to have a telephone call with him. Uh, that, that, that's just the pioneering of, of this and people are, are experimenting. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the big part of NFTs would be tied to this. Uh, a nice example of that can be uh, using NFTs as a key to something. For example, a key to a Decentraland party that you cannot visit otherwise, or just the subscription key to interact with some, with some smart contract on Ethereum blockchain that you cannot interact until you own that key. That can work almost as a subscription to something that does not have this uh, transactional fees some free service that you can access only if you have this key. So a a part of the NFTs as, as the experience is definitely on the horizon. On the creative side of the question, we have the platforms like Async Art that allow you to create these dynamic NFTs built in several layers where you can sell each layer separately and the owner of that layer has the capability to move that layer on the master canvas or to change the color of that layer on the master canvas and then you you own the part of this collective artwork that that can be changed with the owners tweaking it sideways that's only at the beginning
how does some of the these things work technically like so for example like the hidden data like how do you actually accomplish that like you know if all the data on the chain is fully public how do we make it so some data is only accessible by the owner that's that's a very extremely important question so uh, right now this data is serving by us is served by us it's not on chain it's not public we make sure that the owner of nft gives us a signature confirming his wallet ownership and then we stream that data to the person so there is no a great solution to that yet so the the best probably idea is something that new cypher tried to introduce or introduce i'm not really sure is uh, proxy re-encryption when you can re-encrypt the data I, I was talking with my co-founder just last night about this exact thing. We were because we saw the new cipher and keep like merger, and we we're like, "Hey, wait, new cipher! Like, we could do that with NFTs. Like, that's really cool." Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm big fan. My, my personal dream. I know at some point I have this. I know. Let, let's try to dis- explore. So I think the streaming of content is extremely powerful. So as Spotify solved the piracy online because you can't really download the library arbitrary they it's streamed to you one song at a time so you can't literally access it faster than than you can hear it the same can apply to the to the nft metadata so it can be streamed only to the owner and or to the owner of any other key nft and for this to work as as this DRM basically for the decentralized world data. I think that that's really powerful because right now this with this all metadata being public, the economy is missing this this access rights. You, you you were completely right when you said that as an owner you should be able to do something, and if you if you are able to access something only if you're an owner, that that's that's the basic that's the most basic building block out there. You know, I, I've been actually looking quite deeply into some of the NFT standards. Um, one of the things that was a little bit concerning to me right now is like the amount of centralization that's uh, happening within a lot of the NFT stuff. So like, the, like you guys, met, even like the uh, data, hiding the data stuff, like, you know, right now it's totally dependent on verbal system. But, you know, like you mentioned, you know, ideally we want to move it to like new cipher and stuff like that. But like even things as basic as like where the metadata of NFT is is stored. I had thought that more of the metadata would be being stored on chain or maybe at least the hash of a metadata would be stored on chain. But like once I looked into it, I'm like, oh, wow, it's the NFT is literally just pointing at a URL to fetch the data from. And it's like, this can be like centralized URLs and people are storing metadata on like AWS and things like that. And then what was really kind of funny to me was uh, yesterday there was a artist who like, you know, sold all their artwork. And then after they did that, they replaced all of them with pic- like they did a literal rug pull where they replaced all of the pictures with like pictures of like Persian rugs. And I thought that was like really funny. And it's like, how do we like promote better standards in the space? Like, you know, obviously you can solve this by using things like IPFS or Filecoin or Sia Skynet or whatever. But like, what, it seems that this is not the standard right now. And so how do we, how do we like nudge the ecosystem towards that? Excellent question and ideas. So I think it's really important to understand that on-chain isn't the place for the metadata at all. So all, all the metadata for the NFTs cannot be fit into the on-chain data. Blockchain isn't really suitable. Uh, when you upload something on-chain on the Ethereum blockchain, uh, it gets stored on 10,000 nodes uh, at least. So you can't really upload a gigabyte worth of, of video to, to 10,000 nodes. That's why most of the NFTs and NFT providers and NFT servers, they choose IPFS as a storage option. IPFS is much better because it, it works on, on hashes of the content. So when a picture is uploaded to IPFS and then the metadata is uploaded to IPFS, it gives you a hash of that metadata. And this token URI, the URL that you were referring to, it has the hash. 
Uh, so uh, that's that's the ideal scenario for now because ever, if if you have this important NFT out there, you can literally become the another provider for for the metadata to be served. Like obviously Filecoin and other decentralized storage solutions like RV are are the perfect are the perfect use cases for the metadata. You can even have this royalty stream backed into the metadata uh, that that would pay for backed in the, the token that would pay for the metadata storage. And how to promote that? It's it's really simple. You just need to to tell people where the metadata is stored. Uh, for you can you can t you can look it over right now if you go to either scan you will find your nft contract and you'll find uh, you, you click the read contract and, and there would be this token uri uh, method in the contract that would require you, you to paste a token id there and you would see where the metadata is stored if you see a centralized ip a centralized uh, url then then that means that this metadata is completely free to change uh, while of the file file coin and IPFS allows you much much of a better protection. So I think I think yeah I almost feel that at some point we we will see this small check mark on the NFT that would say if that metadata is stored securely or not. Another technical uh, challenge. What you know? I actually tried to mint uh, some NFTs on Rarible, uh, probably almost four or five months ago now. And you know, for context, we were actually trying to mint uh, some NFTs for Epicenter uh, with all the cover art from you know the past five six years, uh, of which you'll have one after this episode, I guess. But you know, we were trying to mint like four hundred <laughs> NFTs, and the gas prices were just way too high. And the and I, I decided not to do the minting then. I was like, all right, let me wait a little bit until the gas prices go down. And uh, lo and behold, that never happened. So now they're like 5x of what they were when I originally tried doing it. So how, how do we solve this problem for like users? Like, you know, you know, especially for artists who like have a lot of artwork that they're trying to sell. And like until they know that there's a buyer, having to pay thousands of dollars just to mint the NFTs is a bit quite high and so have you have you guys looked into things like gasless minting and things like that where like I mean, how i was the, the simple thing i was thinking of was like why can't as an artist i just have a signature uh off-chain signature and that the first buyer set, you know offload the gas cost onto the first buyer so what are some of the ways of doing this that you've been thinking about yeah that, that's the most important problem in, in the whole ethereum space right now the gas prices Obviously, again, the gas prices come from this understanding of the security. You're paying for your stuff to be stored on that many computers that you, you have the best security guarantees out there. And, and your idea about gasless minting is obviously on the table. Several, several marketplaces uh, already implemented that and we will implement that too in the future. But the ultimate solution would be I think the market is moving towards a multi-chain world when NFTs would be able to freely move across different environments being layer 1s and layer 2 solutions. You can start creating your NFT on something like Matic and then if it gets really popular and it's expensive and you want to start using it as a collateral in some lending service on the Ethereum mainnet, you can move it across the bridge and, and, and now it will be living on Ethereum. The same things happens with Flow. We have, we have an enormous amount of requests uh, about trading NBA Top Shot cards at, at some secondary marketplaces. So that's the real future for the NFTs. Luckily, we have this blazing fast layer twos built on ZK rollups right now, such as Starkware uh, or or ZK ZK Sync. They they are the real future for for the scalability of the blockchain. You know, I think that point about like the gas fees are representative of the security you're getting from the network and because you're paying for this to be stored on all these computers and all that and so like you know part of it is like do the nfts really need the same amount of security as the maker dow for example you know like may maybe not and so what do you think about like 
the Dapper Labs approach where like with the flow blockchain and like, do, do you think that we're going to see like a specialized blockchain that's like really focused on NFTs? Or do you think that like NFTs are going to start to co- sort of exist on all these like layer twos? And like, if, if the latter, then like, how do we deal with all this uh, UX overhead of like dealing with NFTs on different chains? There's been all these like issues concerns these days which i don't quite fully understand but people are like oh what if like you start double minting nfts on different chains and does that like destroy the uh scarcity benefits and all that so how do you think about some of these things extremely valuable thoughts so i think you're totally right in by saying that nfts do not need the same security guarantees as a uh, hundred million dollar uh, worth of tokens uh, stored in the Ethereum blockchain. So we'll definitely see, and we are already seeing this NFT tailored blockchain flow. They, they, that's literally their thesis. Uh, one, one concern here is the securitization of the NFT market. What we see with the projects like NFTX that allow you to create a funds for NFT or, or projects like Upshot protocol that allow you to price NFTs and understand how much do they cost in order to create a better lending systems uh, or, or any other solution that requires interoperability between financial services and NFT providers. So I think to me, it feels like there will be a two spaces, one of which will be blazing fast for this media NFTs let's say uh, where the new Facebook, uh, the new social network built on NFT uh, thesis w- would be. And, and the second uh, where this financialized NFTs that are work as an asset class would be stored and operating. Probably that would be in some environment where DeFi market would, would go. And, and with moving across across these environments, you're again extremely right about the double minting and stuff. It's much more hard to to move an NFT across the bridge than any other ERC20 token because uh, you need to move the contract. And uh, what if there was no contract like that on another network? So ultimately, there will there will be always the origin network for the NFT and an origin network for some contract of NFT. And so far, it looks like you will be only able to mint an NFT inside a specific collection only, only on its origin. So if, if the first contract was created on Ethereum network, and then you decided to move this NFT over to Flow, then you would be able to create NFTs only on Ethereum network inside the specific collection that we are referring to. If this collection was created on Flow and you moved a couple of them to Ethereum, then you will be able to mint only on Flow. That's where the market is moving. So it's kind of a multi-chain NFT standard is what the market needs. Well, I believe some people in the Cosmos ecosystem actually were developing something like that. So we should uh, sync up on that. So you mentioned the idea of maybe social network based on NFTs. And I would love if you could, you know, we've talked already about like some of these weird possibilities, you know, with like artworks where different people own different layers, they can change them. And in a way we're talking about like new modes of interaction, new modes of like uh, collaborating with each other, new sort of economic relationships that emerge from this. And, you know, then you mentioned sort of this idea, oh, maybe the next social network would be built on NFT. So I would love if you could just like, what are some of the craziest, most exciting, maybe far out ideas, or like things that you think could happen or products people could build that, you know, you leverage some of these fundamental qualities of NFTs. Once the scalability problem is solved for good, when we have this ability to reach current internet level speed, uh, and once Jesse Walden once said that NFT is the file that you can't copy. So basically, uh, you can. It makes the the internet ownable, and when you find the picture on the social network, 
whose picture is that there there is a lot of copyright infringement out there right now and nfts would just be a better database for all of that where you would understand who is the owner you know there is a this case and we have a really a really famous creator that uh, creates the 3d sculptures that a lot of people just copy it and put on their avatars because they're usually animal faces were really stylish animal faces and this this item was minted on wearable and somebody bought it for ten thousand dollars just to place on his wearable avatar uh, by like properly without without copying the stuff he is the real owner of his social network avatar now of his social network picture I think that that can hint of how this all can be used. You can use only those images that you have rights to. Isn't this beautiful? At some point, uh, this account on the Twitter board Elon Musk, that is like a, a parody account, he sold the right to tweet the next tweet on his account for, for, for $5,000. So that's literally just making every piece of uh, of of the internet ownable and tradable and liquid. I know right now, if you want to buy some IP rights, you are literally just going somewhere uh, in the room and and writing a contract uh, on a paper. It isn't traded like Wall Street and efficient market and and all that stuff. That that NFT is the is the way to bring this liquid market ideas to the IP rights market. Yeah, and, and what's fascinating, this example, right? Like Elon Musk selling the right to the next tweet for some amount. The, you know, the kind of idea it brings up for me is also when you have different people work together, there's like different modes of doing that. You know, there's like, for example, a stock corporation where you say like, oh, we are all kind of organized underneath this thing and, you know, we own shares in it. Or then you have like, you know, some of these, or maybe a contract relationship, right? Where you have like specific deliverables and you pay for that. And in a way it feels like, oh, maybe with an NFT, you can have much more also like fine grained and granular markets and maybe new ways of, you know, sort of splicing and selling products and investing in things as well. Yes, what if you would be able to buy the right to place an advertisement on the account of an uprising blogger star in a couple of years from now? They would got some some pre-order for the ad services. This is actually something that was done by uh, Let's Talk Bitcoin. Uh, they did that many years ago where they, ha they had a token. It was maybe on Counterparty or something, you know, like a long time ago. They sold this uh, LTB ad token, if I remember correctly. And so you could buy it for Bitcoin and then you could kind of go and redeem it for like an ad on Let's Talk Bitcoin. And then I think you also had, you know, in, in principle, this possibility or someone could buy some of the ads and maybe made a later point, they raised the prices. And then, of course, that was pre-NFTs, right? It didn't use NFTs, but I think, yeah, it's sort of an early idea in this direction. The NFT space is early, it's, it's just shown up itself to the public. The public really met it well, and now there will be a massive wave of experimentation. What is really possible with this NFT is we will see a lot of projects emerge in just a half of the year, uh, because right now they're all building somewhere behind the scenes. They're building NFT projects and use cases. So what do you see as the... Uh roadmap for variable as a marketplace do you intend it to focus like you know currently it seems to be mostly focused on the like digital art marketplace but do you also is idea for variable to like specialize and become like the platform for digital art or is it also to like go into these other types of nfts like you know eventually even like DeFi will have to issue, like you know issue nfts you know insurance products or ens names and stuff thank you for for asking that so I think one of, well, one of the really great points in wearable history was launching the liquidity mining program when we basically kickstarted the marketplace business by rewarding people 
with the rights to control the platform. That's a really powerful idea that creates a positive feedback loop. People came for the token and stayed for the product. We are basically expanding in that direction. We are doing the, the progressive decentralization. We are launching the DAO with, with an actual budget that would be controlling the wearable protocol and, and moving towards a protocol business that would be a horizontal protocol with all the liquidity of the NFT captured in one place. Imagine, uh, you can think about it as NFT Uniswap. So uh, all the businesses that would be I using NFTs, NFT, issue, NFT issuers, NFT insurance, as you said, it, the uh, NFT lending services, they all need the single place to make sure that this NFT is not exchangeable, to understand the price of the NFT, to understand that you can sell that NFT in the protocol without touching the wearable website. Th this is the future. This is the future uh, goals for wearable. Uh, now, uh, right now, we see this market diverge. Uh, back then, uh, half of the year ago, Every, every issuance platform that allow you to issue crypto art had its own marketplace. Right now we see that it's really hard to grow a marketplace because there is this chicken and egg problem. People go, buyers go where the sellers are, sellers go where the buyers are. So this liquidity problem for the upcoming NFT projects is a really uh, large pain. Uh, uh, and we intend to solve this with, with a protocol that would allow them to to interact with the marketplaces uh, just only on the protocol level, protocol to protocol interaction. Imagine that you issued an NFT in the same transaction it was automatically placed on, on the auction somewhere on Rarible. And Rarible is the largest front end that has now over the 500,000 eyes looking at it over the last month. It would be serving as a large distribution channel for all the stuff created and pushed to the protocol. Or you can go the other way around and you have a mobile wallet. You have a mobile app that can serve as a storefront for the protocol. The, the same way like MetaMask is doing now. It, it's serving the ERC20 trading to all its clients while interacting with, with on-chain protocols. And, and this protocol's idea that basically emerged in the Ethereum ecosystem is extremely powerful. There has never been as such a resilient API on the internet as the current protocols living on Ethereum ecosystem. That's the higher vision for the wearable next steps. And of course, for it to be community owned and governed by, by, the, by the DAO and its members. We're going to see actually a more NFTization of a lot of things in DeFi. For example, like CDP positions, right? Like currently those are linked to your address, but like, do you see that we're going to like people are going to start building wrappers and stuff around these that turn all of these into NFTs? And like, do you see Rarible becoming a platform for DeFi trading as well of NFTs? Yes, please. We so want this. So we already launched NFTs for your insurance with the partnership with them. And uh, I think Hagic explored some NFTs uh, options. Uh, actually, wrapping a, a CDP inside NFT was already done by the project One Hub on, on the Ethereum East London hackathon. They, they haven't decided to move forward with it, but uh, the, the idea is so right. A lot of projects that are out there in the DeFi world right now, they are so difficult to understand. This YCRV BDC pool, right? When you have only this small place in the ticker for the token to explain the person what this actually is, you can wrap that into an NFT with an image, with a name, with a description. The same exact product would be much more understandable and it would, li it would lie in your wallet in a collectible tab. It will be always there showing you what is your position status. That, that's super important for this space. Uh, and I think the lowest hanging fruit is NFTs that has other ERC20 tokens inside it. So you can literally create this OTC market based on NFTs. If you have a, a hundred thousand tokens that aren't yet as liquid uh, to be traded on Uniswap, you can wrap them and sell, and sell them and batch on 
uh, on some NFT marketplace. Uh, I think Charged Particles is the project that, that started doing something like that already. So is, is that actually a feature that's supported today? Like, can you have NFT's own Ethereum or ERC-20? So uh, we as Rarible support any e ERC-721 and 1155 tokens to be traded. And if you created the token that has uh, that that complies with the NFT standard, but has an extension that allow it to hold other tokens or have other capabilities, then it would be tradable and wearable. And there are several projects that are doing various stuff with extending NFT contracts to be able to hold ARC20 tokens or other NFTs or CDPs or the rights to, to do something in a game, uh, uh, the, the ability to build something on the land that NFT represents and, and that kind of stuff. Can you tell us a bit about this ele uh, ERC-1155? Because, you know, I, I think everyone's probably heard of ERC-721s because that's like, you know, the NFT standard that's existed for three, four years now, CryptoKitties. I think they helped, like Dapper Labs helped create it and stuff. But this 1155 one is newer. So can you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, let's start with ERC-721. So the way it works underneath is basically a contract that has these records that NFT number five belongs to the wallet 0x123 xyz and it has this token URI with metadata. So it's it's a token ID, it's a owner wallet, and it's a metadata. That's ERC721. What ERC1155 brings is semi-fungibility. It adds the number of tokens that this uh, particular address holds to, to the equation. It, it, it can work like, like a gold, bronze, and a silver in a game. You have five of gold and, and 10 of bronze and one of the silver. So it's basically an NFT token with a balance. We, we utilize that standard to create NFT with additions. The author can mint a hundred of the same NFTs and sell only 50 of them on, on, on one marketplace and 50 of them on another marketplace, for example. That's arguably makes NFTs, 1155 NFTs on the same level as ERC20 NFTs because you can actually do everything with, with 1155 NFTs that you could do with ERC20. So, so when, I, when I was buying uh, the art, this art, right, they, there was like different yeah, additions, right? So one, two, three, so an artist could say, oh, I make this artwork and I, you know, either they sell it just to one person or they could say, oh, I'm creating three of it and five of it. And then those tokens, yeah, they, they are then fungible underneath. There's no, for example, like ordering of them. Yes, exactly right. There is no ordering of them. All of them are the same. Uh, that's actually funny that no, not all blockchains have this ability to create uh, semi-fungible NFTs. For example, on the Flow blockchain, uh, when you have a hundred of NFTs devoted to a specific player, they are all different. They have ordering and they have unique IDs and numbers. And that resulted in the funny cases when the NFT number seven for the player number seven uh, costs much more than the, other, uh, than the same other NFTs with other IDs. You know, you talked before about Uniswap and then the idea of wearable being something like Uniswap, where you have this kind of, you know, very widely integrated token exchange standard. Can you talk a little bit about like, what are the challenges around, you know, liquidity and trading and markets with NFTs, right? Because it's something very different with like, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum and you have this like huge supply and you know, order book exchanges, I guess that kind of stuff doesn't, doesn't work for NFTs, no? Yeah, so the biggest invention of the DeFi world and, and Uniswap and other trading, uh, trading venues is, is the notion of AMM, automated market making, when you can supply some some parts of the product, su supply, supply uh, tokens in the pool, this supply would be used as an extra liquidity for everybody who, who comes to trade. That single invention allowed 
exchanges to get rid of the order book. Oh, Uniswap doesn't have an order book underneath. All the previous exchanges, all the previous DAXs, like uh, either Delta or something like this, that were order book based, basically were deemed uh, obsolete on, on this event. Because, because this, this massive liquidity on Uniswap allow you to, to swap a million dollars with the minimum slippage right now. That was the biggest invention for, for the DeFi world for fungible tokens. And the, same, and the same invention isn't really working for NFTs. NFTs are singular by nature. They, they all are different and you need to have an actual, uh, an actual separate order book for each NFT out there. If this is a one of one NFT, you can only have bids for five, ten, and hundred and thousand dollars for that NFT, and that would be all of it. So we are dealing with a massive number of different order books, and each each order creation or deletion would cost you gas prices, and this is a challenging world. So I think these are the first the first challenges that we will encounter, and and I believe this. Uh, this adds another level of fractionalization when NFTs start to live on, on different layer ones and layer twos and they start moving across these this environments. So the markets aren't moving for, with them. Uh, the order books stay on, on the exchange where they were created. This all is this fractionalized world of a lot of people want to buy and sell different NFTs. And you kind of have to glue it, this together to, to capture this liquidity, to, to make sure that if you bought an NFT, you can sell it even with a, it was a cheaper price, but, but you can do it. That, that's, that's the biggest challenge out there. And so, you know, we mentioned, uh, you mentioned briefly earlier about the uh, liquidity or the yield farming uh, that you guys did with Rarible with the Rarity token. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that. So, you know, what was the goal of the Rarity token and uh, how did you guys choose to distribute it and why did you choose it to do it that way? The marketplace business is, is a re really fun and rewarding business because it's, it kind of works as self-perpetuating. Once you have clients, uh, they, they bring more clients. And, and again, as I was saying, buyers go where the sellers are and sellers go where the buyers are. That's one of the oldest I know, business model aggregation places out there. We, we had marketplaces uh, from, from the ancient times. And the, all the marketplaces have this cold start problem when initially you have none of the buyers and none of the sellers and you need to grow the marketplace if the first buyers come they have no 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 goods to buy and when the first sellers come they have no no buyers to buy their goods so this is what makes the marketplace business extremely hard and uh, we experienced the same thing at rarible when we started uh, the initial growth was was very was very slow we, we were growing, we were growing several times per month, but it still f felt very slow. We started in November and over the next seven months of building the marketplace in May, we had this huge spike that resulted in $30,000 uh, worth of NFT traded on the platform. Now we're doing a million dollar daily and, and, and that was a huge spike in May. And uh, so over the seven months, we, we've been able to acquire only that amount of liquidity. So we decided to add some gas to, to that market and, and created this governance token that gives you rights to, to control the platform and started rewarding people directly for their activity on the marketplace. So we are distributing 75,000 Rary tokens since the July 13, the day of the, of the token launch every week proportionally to the volume of that buyers and sellers did. So 37 and 5,000 tokens go to all the buyers who made the volume over a week and the same number go to all the sellers who made the volume over the week. So basically that creates this extra level of, of competition uh, that if there is a low week with a low trading volume, you, you kind of want to be in that week because you would receive the higher portion of, of the weekly distribution. 
And and this been so so great. This worked so great for the platform. Now, last week we distributed 2.5 million dollar worth of rewards to all the buyers and sellers. This 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 what really adds some fuel to to the marketplace. And this is the liquidity mining program that that we are talking about. I don't think any other marketplaces in Dapp 2.0 world ever ever done something like this. How do you prevent like wash trading just to uh, earn rare tokens? Long story short, it's hard, and that's probably one of the successes of the platform. So we analyze that activity inside the team internally with a special with a special attitude. We're looking at uh, at a lot of parameters like where did your funds came from, who have you interacted on the platform, who have you interacted before the platform uh, who are your buyers and sellers how many of them are verified all that stuff is extremely important and we have this multi layer system when we can withhold uh some reward and then the person can claim that it was withhold wrongfully and they can give us the proof of the legitimacy that's been a complicated system uh, that we developed o- o- over fighting this and uh so far that that works it's, it's all what I, I can say it's not perfect there is some amount of people trying to to game the system um, but we're constantly fighting with them and to as we move towards the DAO, we will slowly decrease this liquidity mining volume program to towards more of a fundamental stuff like fin- financing development of the marketplace, like uh, financing the marketing activities such as ambassador program. Uh, so right now we have this rare staking proposal being drafted that would uh, give you rights uh, to control the, the DAO treasury to fund some proposals that can improve the system. This, this is the real proof civil resistance system of of controlling of the reward so once you have this uh dao that like you know is the very governance how do you see the relationship between the dao and the development team going forward so you know i i see right now that in the device space or there, there seems to be like two models that are emerging like and i call them the uni model versus the sushi model and the uni model is like this like cathedral model while sushi is like the bazaar while because like with uni it's like yes here's this like governance token but like i mean i have no idea what uniswap v3 is and like governance holders have like no say in what uniswap v3 is basically meanwhile sushi is like you know they're hiring people through like governance they're like making protocol decisions through governance like everything is going through governance and so how, where do you see like a uh, very token governance falling in this spectrum. So I think we have this problem of gradual decentralization right now explored in the wild because a lot of projects started as a centralized companies and they have centralized leadership and the core team and and this structure is extremely efficient if you want to have fast decisions. I, I can gather my team and ship a new feature is j- in just one day, literally. Where, whereas when we're dealing with the DAO uh, and this governance proposal that, that is working uh, on, on in- increasing the value inside the system, it's almost like a, a private versus public sectors in the country uh, where government uh, is working sometimes slow but it's really resilient and it's really representative representative in terms of who which which votes are are counted uh, while there is a private market that is extremely efficient and fast and, and make decisions and they are balancing each other out so i i believe something like that would, would re- really wo- work in the long run uh, although I, I might be wrong about it, and of course we'd love to build the DAO that can manage all the protocol and hires and all of it. Just not sure that this dream is really possible to, to achieve out there. Uh, how does this DAO rollout look like? And you know, what are some of the things this DAO is going to be, you know, capable of doing? The DAO is only starting. 
and and oh, right now we have like five proposals of improving and so far they are all about the DAO structure uh, one of the proposals is a meta proposal of uh, how proposals should be created there is a new proposal on the new liquidity mining program Twix so th these are the first steps in, in this decentralized activity what I would really love to see is for the development and marketing groups to emerge for, for some teams to perform an actual job to promote the protocol and for to make the protocol better and to be funded by the core by the core governance uh, team that would be rewarded as well so that's what we're building now this staking process how it would work is you need to lock your tokens for a specific period of time and, and the longer you lock them, the more voting power you've got. And uh, since, since you locked your tokens, that creates a trust in the system. We can trust the person that has uh, his skin in the game. We're absolutely sure that this person would do whatever they can to protect their stake, basically, in the system. That voting power would be then used to, to vote on proposals on, on, the, on the treasury distribution to fund, to fund activities that perform an actual work for the protocol by, by developing it or marketing it. That's, that's the base model for the DAO. For example, we can fund another issuance protocol that is uh, thinking about connecting to wearable protocol for trading. And, and to be a valuable member inside the wearable protocol since they are ones who use the protocol for their own product. That's the dream model for us. Yeah, I mean, so this is all super exciting. And, you know, I mentioned earlier in the episode, we were trying to do the Epicenter uh, NFT sale. And maybe this episode was a little bit uh, self-serving because I, you know, just want to learn more about wearable and NFTs so, I, you know, we can execute on this uh, sale. And so do you have any advice? Like, you know, part of it was, you know, I mentioned that part of it was, you know, we didn't like the gas costs were too high for us to mint earlier. But no, that that seems like a, a foregone problem at this point. But part of it was we also just wanted to do something interesting. You know, we wanted to like I don't know why I had this vision in my head, like, let's decentralize a podcast. I don't even know what that means, but I want to do it. You know, I had some ideas of like, okay, maybe. So I actually built a uh, integration for a snapshot. So it's in the snapshot page that like all the DeFi protocols use for governance. I actually built an integration for that where you can like vote based off of NFT ownership rather than uh, fungible token ownership. What is something cool that you think we could do with like uh, Epicenter with these like NFTs or like having, you know, something cool pricing model or some cool usage, like based off of what you've seen so far happening? I've seen several great models happening so far. Now, as you speak about tokenizing some, some Epicenter episodes, I instantly had this thought uh, about making making a game over it when people uh, when when founders can can be assembled in teams <laughs> that can play football uh, are like like so rare does with mm -hmm. NFTs or that can can play businesses such as Swap versus Uniswap. Uh, I don't know if you, if you had both of them on on the uh, on the epicenter. So I think not the real advice, but but the best what I can say is to be innovative in, in terms of the use cases. Uh, people are are quite okay on it with understanding how NFTs work now, and NFTs possibilities are literally endless. You you can you can stack them one over other, as they say with this assembling NFTs uh, from, from football. We have this project that's called Ether Cards that are building this gamification framework on top of the NFTs. So that, for example, if you've collected this six NFTs, you would receive the seventh uh, master NFT that, that, that represents that you, you've got a collection uh, or, or again, selling them on a bonding curve, as you suggested. It's another great idea to understand how how dynamic demand is and what can be different pricing. I think uh, Blau did nice job uh, launching the, his audio NFTs. There was an auction that the the top 
one winner received some of the perks, uh, the top one bidder received some of the perks, and then the next five bidders received another set of, of, of results, and the next five bidders received something else. So that concentrated people across just one sale and gave them this ability to not only win the, the one auction, but, uh, but to be a participant as well. And I think like every, every participant eventually got something like a, this gratitude NFTs. All that mechanics are yet to be explored and, and you can come up with something really cool. You can create some, uh, some regular issues of NFTs some uh, play with royalty streams giving to I know, founders that you tokenize. There is a lot to do. I think you just want to hang out in some NFT communities and hear the amazing thoughts. I know I enjoy these clubhouse rooms with people talking about NFTs daily, nightly, proposing some, some crazy stuff to do. I don't know, it's, it's been exciting space and exciting times, guys. My mind's been just racing all week, just like, oh, there's all these like, cool ideas that you could do with NFTs. And so I'm really excited to like see how it evolves. Yeah, and the same thing for me. I mean, thanks so much, Alex. It was really a huge pleasure to have you on. And for me, it's also been like really quite mind blowing and awesome to like dive into NFTs these last like two days. So super excited to see where Rarible is going. And I'm sure this there's going to be many more nft episodes in the future so thanks so much for coming on thank you for inviting me it, it, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you guys the questions are awesome cool thank you thank you for joining us on this week's episode we release new episodes every week you can find and subscribe to the show on itunes spotify youtube soundcloud or wherever you listen to podcasts and if you have a google home or alexa device you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.